Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Wednesday webinar series, Lunch with the Birds, presented by the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative. My name is Amanda Duran, and I'm the program coordinator for the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative. And I'm very happy that you are able to join us for our webinar today on raptor biology. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know about some of our upcoming webinars, um, some topics for this summer. We'll be having a webinar on creating certified wildlife habitat in your yard as well as a webinar on fall warblers, some ecology and identification of the fall warblers. And then finally, a presentation on backyard bird feeding coming up in the fall. So um, make sure you stay tuned into our website, obcinet.org, for information on um, scheduling and registration for our upcoming webinars. Also, if you'd like to take a look at some of the recordings of our past webinars, they're available at the address you see here at the top of your screen, youtube.com slash obci1. And uh, I would like to especially emphasize that our latest uh, video is up now on the Spring Warblers uh, webinar that we had last month by Tom Sheely. So definitely um, check out that recording. So as we get started today, I'm very excited to have with us Barbara Ray. She is the Wildlife Education Director at the Ohio Wildlife Center and an adjunct pr professor at Otterbein University. And she'll be speaking with us today about raptor biology. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Barbara. All right, welcome everybody. Um, we're going to find out some really amazing things about our uh, birds of prey or our raptors. And the raptor family itself refers to our hawks and eagles, our owls, falcons, and vultures. And really it's the anatomy of the birds more than the diet that defines a raptor. But most people think of raptors and they know that they're also called birds of prey. And they really think about them based on the fact that they eat other animals. So it's more of a diet definition. The term raptor comes from the Latin raptare, which means plunderer or to seize and carry away, which of course is what they do for a living. <laughs> Raptors also have some very unique adaptations from the other bird species, and most notably people uh, think about their hooked beaks and their talons, but there's a lot of other really incredible adaptations um, to help them be suited for their um, prey lifestyle and just their hunting uh, habits and breeding habits in general. The most notable feature besides their talons would be their beak, and they do have a hooked beak. Some of those beaks are a little bit more specialized, um, such as the Everglades kite and some of the raptors that have bright or large uh, beaks. Those bills may play a role in their uh, breeding display or territorial displays as well. Um, they're not the only birds in the world with a hooked beak. Certainly the parrot family or citizens have hooked beaks, and if anybody's ever been bitten by one of those birds, it's a massive hooked beak. <laughs> um, but other than the citizens, which really are known for being able to crack hard-shelled uh, seeds and nuts, the hooked beak of our birds of prey is really specialized for, for tearing or extracting meat. So here's our endangered Everglades kite, also called the snail kite. And this bird has a really unique adaptation in that it's evolved al right alongside the apple snail and green sna or green snail, as they're also called, um, in that the snail has a very specific curvature to its shell that the snail kite's bill uh, matches that curve precisely. So they can put their bill inside the shell, even though the the snail itself has a carapace. Um, they can pierce right through that and reach in the interior of the shell, pull the muscle off of the shell, and extract the snail's body. The talons are another unique feature for our birds of prey. They have an extreme uh, gripping, a pow gripping power. Some of our birds can exert hundreds of pounds of pressure when they close their talons. They also have a tendon in the leg um, that actually sort of locks their talons in position when they grasp their prey. But for the uh, falcons in particular and the owls, the, the blow or impact um, of the feet is just as important as the gripping and piercing abilities. So they'll use their feet to actually dispatch prey by actually striking it in mid-flight. 
Raptor eyes are specially designed to be see, see, allow them to see at long distances, but really a whole session could be done just on their eyes and their uh, vision because there's so much incredible anatomy uh, and adaptation, both for nocturnal and diurnal, but also things like the muscle structure that controls the lens. And their lens is extremely curved, which pushes the um, lens as far away from um, the retina as possible, which gives them a lot more um, focal length and telescopic ability. But they also have muscles that can flatten that lens so they can change that focal length uh, at will. Their retina has got a lot more sensory cells and they have uh, pectin, which is a special um, organ in the eye filled with blood vessels that increase their uh, retinal ability. I think a lot of people talk about raptors having vision 10 times that of humans, but their visual acuity in reality is probably about two to three times that of humans. But if that two or three times means that a great horned owl sitting on a goalpost at the end of a football field at midnight can see the little mouse scurrying around at the other end of the football field goalpost in the dark or near dark, um, that's a lot because we would never be able to see that probably even in broad daylight. <laughs> One of the curious things that raptors do often is when they're perched or near the ground, um, or maybe up in a tree, but especially birds that we might interact with as closer to the ground level or handling birds that are in captive settings, often will turn their heads upside down. And their eyes are somewhat divided in how the cells work for their, their vision and the, the telescoping effect. And from mid, midway portion of the eye and below is really designed for long distance vision. So they're basically farsighted, the lower portion of their eye, which means if they're sitting fairly close to the ground, it's not, their vision's just not necessarily as good as if they were up in the air. This is especially true of the, the soaring birds that hunt on the wing. Um, but the lower, the upper half of their eye then can see things up close. So if they want to see something up close while they're on the ground, they just can flip their head upside down and get a little better visual acuity for close-up objects. So the colors of their eyes are not by accident, they're by design. Um, their eye pigments and cells are designed to amplify um, their vision and they have lipid cells and oil droplets in their eyes that provide contrast. So a little bit, seabirds take this to the extreme. So a seabird um, that does a lot of diving, say, is going to have some uh, lipids in the eye that when the bird dives in the water for a fish, for example, the bird is either going to see the fish looking dark and the background water looking lighter, or if they have the opposite, usually red or blue eye droplets, then they may see the fish as a light uh, object or item in the water against a dark background. And that contrast then allows them to focus on an actual prey item and distinguish it from the background environment. Um, great horned owls probably have the most extreme um, pigment, which accounts for their extremely bright yellow eyes. And in that thick, um, layer of the iris called the stroma. They actually have um, the liquid droplets and they have some crystalline uh, granules that surround those, those pigment cells. And those vary in color a little bit. Um, and they're what we call birefringent. So they actually polarize light and cause it to travel at different speeds. And we know that um, owls have binocular vision like humans. I often refer to them having binocular hearing because they hear sounds um, at slightly different time uh, lapses as sound enters their ear, which allows them to um, focus on a single point in space. Well, really, in some ways, they have binocular um, ability to detect light. <laughs> so they're getting, they're getting light um, into the eye 
connected to the brain, information to the brain at different speeds. And again, that just helps their visual abilities. The, the um, pigment that makes up most of their eye color is a pigment called xanthropterin. This is also the same yellow pigment seen in a lot of our butterflies um, that create that really brilliant um, yellow sheen with the pigments in the butterfly scales. Um, as you go deeper into that layer of the stroma of the iris, um, the color becomes a little bit more clear. So in the upper left-hand slide, you can see the edge um, of the right at the pupil. There's a, a lot of yellow pigment, that xanthropterin. And as you move deeper into the layer of that iris, you'll see the, the color dissipate as those cells become clear. But it does make for that nice, brilliant color of the great horned owl. And if you look at screech owls, um, and some of those animals that have more of the light green or silvery colored eyes. They just have a little bit less xanthropterin, but they still have these specialized um, pigment cells to help increase the light. Um, raptors also have some really good ears, um, especially the owls, which are rather specialized for that, and are harriers. Um, some species have what we call offset ears or asymmetrical ear openings. Um, a lot of times, if you look at the skulls of different raptors, the, the ear openings themselves look fairly symmetrical, but the actual conformation of the bone that makes up the ear opening is quite different from left to right side. Um, the screech owl is probably one of the most extreme, where their left and right ears are actually at totally different planes <laughs> um, along their skull. So I'll show a skull here in a second. Um, but they are designed to hear um, the faintest of sounds with the and, and can hear the widest range of frequencies of all birds that have been studied so far, and that's true of the owls. So this is a barn owl in the upper left picture using some uh, a tool to kind of pull back the facial disc to see the ear opening. And if you look carefully at the feathers right along the margins of the ear openings, you can really see they're, um, they're very thinly arranged so that sound can go right through them. And the facial disc feathers, of course, are totally designed as a funnel to direct that sound into that ear opening. So here's some um, skulls. This is just a top view of a, a barn owl, a barred owl, and a great horned owl. Just a little bit of the, so from the top view, if you look at the barn owl, you see just a little slightly different bone shape um, on the, uh, what would be the bird's left ear, the right side in the picture. Um, a little bit different indentions in the barred owl. Um, and it's the, on the great horned owl on the bottom, the lower portion of that skull has a little bit bigger cup then the upper portion is actually set back a little bit more so than um, not so much a horizontal difference as a lateral difference. And here's a screech owl, barred owl, and the great horned. And again, with the barred owl and the great horned owl, you don't really see that the ear openings are at really significantly different levels, but the shape of the cups and the bone conformation is extremely different, really, when you start to measurements on that, on the bone there. Um, another feature of raptors is the females have well-developed right and left ovaries, and most of our bird families just have well-developed right ovaries. Not really sure why they have both, so that would be something that would be interesting to know a little bit more about. <laughs> There's about uh, 292 diurnal species of raptors, and we have 162 nocturnal species, which makes up largely our owl species. Um, 20 of those owl species live in the United States. Uh, a kind of little amazing thing is that 14 of those 20 live in Arizona during the spring and summer. <laughs> um, so where do those other birds live, right? <laughs> Anyway, raptors have been reclassified uh, based on recombinant DNA uh, testing, uh, whereas they were taxonomically arranged by their morphology. So we now have, we now have four 
families and three subfamilies. Um, so just a really quick list if anybody was interested in those uh, owls that are found in Arizona part of the year. Um, those are your species. And some of these live in Ohio, of course. So we have uh, several of these that live in Ohio. And the other species not found in Arizona then are the barred boreal, uh, northern hawk owl, great gray, snowy, and eastern screech owl. Um, the recombinant DNA testing, basically the um, DNA is, is split and one strand is placed uh, in with a strand of another bird. And depending on the amount and location of the protein bindings that occur, indicates how similar the two species might be. So it's a relatively simple test in terms of the things we can do with, with DNA analysis now. Um, plasma proteins are also diagnosed and examined to determine common ancestry with, with our animals, um, probably across many taxonomic groups, not just mammals or birds. Um, most of our um, non-owl raptors are, uh, appear to be descended from water bird ancestors. Um, so this would include our gulls, storks, albatrosses, and those kinds of birds. Whereas the owls belong to the nightjar and the whippoorwill family, if you go back into their history. And it makes sense if you've ever seen an owl up close um, when they're feeding or opening their mouth, they have the same wide mouth um, conformation of the nightjar family. So they have a lot in common physiologically still um, in, with birds that eat insects on the wing like that. So does anybody know the most cosmopolitan species we have? <laughs> um, they're found on all continents except Antarctica. And we have four species that are widespread in this way. They, you kind of have a cheater picture there on this slide for one of them, right? This is our short-eared owl. The peregrine, barn owl, and osprey are also uh, found just about everywhere in the world. <clears throat> Um, we do have um, a lot of variety in how long these birds have been around. Um, our occipiters are our oldest family, came on the scene about the time T. rex would have been becoming <laughs> extinct uh, about 60 million years ago. So I guess there was a 10 million year gap in there, but <laughs> still a very long time ago. Um, then the osprey is, there's only one species in that subfamily. Um, Pandiono, Pandionidae, and they're only 26 million years old. And then our uh, turkey vultures and New World vultures are uh, about 37, so they fall in the middle there. Falcons, also about 26 million years old. And um, the New World vultures are actually convergent with the Old World vultures. So I think a lot of people think of all the vultures grouped together, but the Old World vultures are actually more like eagles that instead of um, catching their own prey, really turn strictly to carrion eaters. And of course, bald eagles aren't that far removed from carrion eaters because they also will um, eat a lot of carrion, um, at least in certain places throughout the country. Um, they may be eating a lot of carrion in the winter and less fish even right here in Ohio. Um, and then a, a kind of a curious thing is the Europeans refer to most of our broadwing hawk species as buzzards. But in this country, people know buzzards to be vultures. But it's really from the French boussard, which means hawk, and it still properly refers to our, our BDOs and our broadwing hawks. But you would get an argument from most Americans if you tried to explain that to them. <laughs> so there's some really interesting similarities and differences between the different families. Um, each group of birds has different molt patterns. Um, obviously they have different bone conformation. The little bone that's visible in the nostril of the falcons, the tubercle, it's actually a way for that bird to be able to fly at high speeds, several hundred miles per hour in a stoop and not blow out its lungs. So if, uh, if you picture an airplane turbine jet and 
the um, little cone inside the jet turbine um, kind of has the same effect. It's actually breaking up the flow of air when a plane is flying a couple hundred, 400, 500 miles an hour. Um, you don't want to blow up the engine. You just want the air to flow through there uh, for the combustion part of the chambers. But the same effect in these birds, if that air were to rush directly into their nostrils um, at a couple hundred miles an hour, it would burst their lungs. <clears throat> they do have an extra pair of vertebra in their tail that's actually fused to the pigistil to support their tail. Um, and probably the best thing to do is go online and look up on um, some video clips of peregrines. They have some great video available now to National Geographic and, and other uh, groups that have gotten some uh, film footage right on the birds. They put cameras right on the birds and then gotten close-up shots of the birds flying. And if you watch how they use their tail, it becomes pretty apparent. It's almost like an airplane tail flap, um, how they can control it with a lot of rigidity um, for the way they have to fly. Um, their tongues are short and fleshy, more like the parrot family. Um, whereas most of our hawks and eagles have a really thin, um, stiff or, or hard tongue, really. <clears throat> and they have a very elaborate syrinx. And they're also very vocal. Those that have been around falcons know <laughs> they're the noisiest, pretty much, of our raptor family. Um, falcons have a lot of similarities to the owls. And if you picture that um, barn owl skull that we showed earlier, and just picture a barn owl in general, uh, there's a lot of similarities between uh, particularly the barn owls and the falcons. They have physiologically and uh, anatomically their jaw muscles and nerve networks are very similar to the owls. They use their bill and their feet to dispatch their prey, just like owls do. Um, they don't particularly build nests. Um, they will you know, create scrapes, and, and owls will sometimes actually put nest material in their nests, but in general they're stealing somebody else's nest, or they're nesting in cavities and not necessarily building their own. Um, both young of falcons and owls hiss when they're threatened, so they actually make a hissing sound. Um, they do a lot of head bobbing, both curiosity and defensively. And instead of um, squirting their mutes, uh, bending over and shooting them out away from the area, they actually drop their mutes. Both uh, owls and falcons eat small stones. And for their overall body size uh, and weights, they lay very, very large eggs. One of the differences between those two species, however, is uh, the eggs of owls tend to be very, very round, a little bit rounder even than a, a chicken egg. Um, and falcon eggs are very elliptical. They have a, a, almost a pointy end. And since they tend to nest on cliffs or flat surfaces with perhaps just a few stones, maybe not even much of a depression, um, those eggs could roll off the edge of the cliff. So by having a pointed end, the eggs simply roll around themselves and they don't go too far. <clears throat> um, a few things about the occipiters, which includes our um, around here would be our Cooper's hawks, um, our sharp shin hawks, and osprey. Um, they have 14 neck vertebra, vertebra, so a little less than other raptors. They have different chromosomes and nitrogen in their shells. So these are some really, you know, kind of microbiology differences between the species, but it's kind of interesting. Um, and then osprey are really odd because they have some characteristics of every other type of raptor. Um, they don't have eye ridge bones um, they, as, like the hawks do. Um, they don't sun themselves like the vultures do. But they do have zygodactyl feet like owls do. Um, they have the bony ridges on their knees and tendons. And of course, those are all features designed to help them grasp fish. Whereas owls hunting at night, those zygodactyl foot formations and tendons help them grasp prey in, in darkness or near darkness, where even though the owl knows exactly where that prey item is, at the moment he actually strikes it, and he's attempting to strike it on the back of the neck or head area, um, he might be a little off. So by having talons virtually going out every direction, um, they have a little better shot at grasping a hold of that prey in less than ideal conditions. 
And then, but their feathers and their feet tendons are designed like the vultures. So a little bit like a hawk, a little bit like a vulture, or a little bit like an owl. <coughs> the vulture family includes our New World vultures, turkey vulture, black vulture condors, and they have some really, really cool adaptations. Um, for those of you that are really hot in the summer and can't get into the air-conditioned buildings right away, you can just go to the bathroom, right down your legs, and cool those blood vessels on your legs, and probably reduce your body temperature a couple degrees. <laughs> um, the perforate nostrils, which if, they're, if you're looking straight at the side of a turkey vulture, um, the profile, you can see right through. Those nostrils have a big gaping uh, entryway there. These, these are vultures that have a really good sense of smell. They're one of the few bird species that has a good sense of smell. And of course, they're detecting the rising odors, the rotting carcasses in the heat thermals coming off the ground. <laughs> um, but that perforate nostril allows a lot of odor to get in there and have a larger surface area for their olfactory cells to work. And when they're sticking their head in that nice rotten flesh and getting it all over their face, Really, all they have to do is shake their head to clear that, that opening. And the sun can even shine down in those nostrils and um, kill off any bacteria that's going to try to develop from the food that they eat. They don't have a halix claw or the large hind talon that the other raptors have. In fact, they really don't have much gripping power at all. Um, a lot of our um, zoos and education centers display vultures and, and handle them on the glove even, but they really just stand on the glove. They don't really have the ability to kind of hold on. Um, they just have to balance up there. And they're actually convergent with the old world vultures on the carrion eating. So um, some species develop from the same family line and then split off how they behave. These are two unrelated groups of birds, old world vulture and two world, who have adapted the same feeding technique. Let's see how we're doing on time here so I don't go over. Okay, we're good. Um, the owls are about 60 million years old. Um, the barn owl is a little bit of an evolutionary intermediary. And again, now that we've kind of looked at some of their conformation features, they're a little bit like falcons, a little bit like owls. Um, owls have a large tapetum which is a reflective layer of cells. So along with all those other amazing adaptations, they just have a mirror in the back of their eye. So any light that enters through the um, eye goes through the tapetum to the retina, and that light is then reflected back against the retina a second time. So it illuminates everything basically twice as much. So just a very small uh, little available light will be illuminated a couple times than, than the light you and I would see if we were seeing the same light. Um, I already mentioned their binocular hearing, and of course they have specialized feathers for uh, silent flight. And they have uh, fringe um, and rough edges, especially on their flight feathers, on the leading margins of their, their flight feathers, which act as a muffler system, so that as they're gliding or even flapping their wings, the, the air is not shearing over the edge of the wing. It's actually broken up. And a good way to experiment with how this works is uh, take a piece of paper and uh, hold the edge of the piece of paper up and blow on it so you can hear that kind of whistling sound on the edge of the piece of paper. And then take a paper towel or a Kleenex and do the same thing because those are two items that have that kind of rough edge compared to a, a piece of paper. And you won't get as loud a sound or, or maybe not much sound at all. <clears throat> Raptors go by a lot of different names. Um, obviously, people call the American Eagle is, is in reference to our bald eagle. Um, White-breasted buzzard or chicken hawk. And if you think about the birds you've seen around, uh, especially our freeways, you know we're talking about the red-tailed hawk because they do tend to have the white chest with um, maybe the black belly band. Unfortunately, they also got blamed a lot um, for capturing, killing chickens, and, and causing a lot of destruction in farmyards. Um, there's no doubt that somewhere, some place in the world, a red-tailed hawk has probably eaten a chicken. But by and large, um, chicken 
destruction in uh, coops and farmyards is work of uh, great horned owls who will actually fly right down on the ground, walk into a chicken coop, and often behead a number of them without actually eating all of them. Uh, mink or raccoons, uh, possibly foxes. So um, red tail hawk only weighs about a pound and a half, and most of our domestic chickens anyway are, are, are much larger than that, not their typical prey. Um, the blue hawk or marsh hawk is our northern harrier. That's actually pictured on the slide. Um, little blue darter or bullet hawk is um, our sharpie. And the big blue darter then, what looks like a sharpie, our cooper's hawk. Um, and then the kitty hawk or sparrow hawk, most people are familiar as a kestrel, American kestrel and our rock hawk or duck hawk um, is our peregrine falcon and we're going to actually meet a peregrine here in just a little bit. The raptors also um, have different behaviors. The cooper's hawks and osprey are kind of flighty high strung animals and um, I work with a rehabilitation center so when we get these birds in rehabilitation it's really a challenge to keep them from bashing themselves around while they're in the a hospital trying to be rehabilitated. The broadwings and um, buteos are a lot more laid back, um, very calm by comparison. Harriers are a little bit more social. They sometimes will have communal roosts in the winter. And the vultures, of course, are very social. They have uh, quite a bit of um, social hierarchy behavior that they exhibit. But the Harris hawk is really the only what you might call a pack animal in the raptor world. So these guys will hunt cooperatively. Um, they'll take turns chasing. They have a really coordinated way of organizing themselves to chase, say, a jackrabbit through the um, desert. And sometimes to locate their prey, they'll sit on the top of a cactus and sometimes stack themselves with one Harris hawk standing on the shoulders of another one. And they may be four or five birds high to start that process. Um, there's also different behaviors by gender. Um, female raptors are often larger than the males and obviously there's a, a larger metabolic cost to egg laying so they have a larger body mass that's probably a part of this they um, they also do more of the brooding and so they have a larger brood patch having that larger bo body uh, males have a brood patch but their brood patch area is a lot smaller but the main thing is when you have both birds at the nest site guarding the nest and, and courting and making the nest, um, invaders are going to be easily chased off. But once the female's on those eggs or on young, she might be at the nest by herself a large portion of the time while the male is out hunting. So if you're not going to have two birds guarding the nest, it's really helpful to be the size of two birds. And that way they can protect themselves and their nesting area um, against aggressive invaders literally and it may be depending on the species it might be male invaders but um, for example the peregrine falcon if, if another female falcon enters that territory um, sometimes they will get in battles to the death so the larger um, smarter more fit falcon is going to win those battles um, <clears throat> we don't have that much dimorphism in our vulture family and our condors usually the males are actually a little bit larger among our um, California condors. <clears throat> so here's a little, um, some examples of some of the size differences. Um, so female kestrels average 150 grams, males are right around 100. Um, so they're not always twice the size, but there are, there are individuals in different species where, uh, particularly screech owls, the males range around 100 and some grams and the females tend up toward 200 grams little more difference with those guys. There's also interesting behaviors, how they hunt and their success at hunting. Most of our juvenile raptors um, may have as low as a 30% success rate when they attempt to capture prey. So this accounts for a lot of these birds failing their first year, um, making fatal errors, or just becoming so weak that they can no longer hunt with the speed and prowess that they really, they don't have that that practice yet and so they're compromised before they've even built um, built up their their um, hunting prowess 
So we see these birds come in emaciated or, or injured because they're, they're hanging too close to the ground or, or making flight errors and getting struck by cars. And some of them even fly into objects. Um, mature birds usually will have a 60 to 75% success rate. And certain individuals have perfected it um, in the 90 percentile. <laughs> so um, for comparison, lions usually have about a 37% success rate. Harris hawks average about 50% cooperatively hunting, and probably our most efficient hunters on the planet are the African wild dogs that when they attempt a, a capture, they rarely miss. And they also hunt cooperatively. <clears throat> Birds of prey use uh, different search and capture techniques. Um, obviously, they have to learn both for ultimate survival. A lot of juveniles lack the actual attack skills, so they can search and find the prey, but it takes them a while to perfect the actual capture portion, attack and capture. So birds listen, they soar, um, they do what's called prospecting. If anybody's ever seen a cooper's hawk, dive into um, some shrubs or evergreens to chase out whatever might be in there. Often it's some sparrows and then they can chase them down and, and get a meal. Um, quartering is what we see happening with uh, short-eared owls and harriers. Um, short-eared owls fly like butterflies over the field um, looking for and listening for prey um, as do harriers. And then still searching is just our red-tailed hawk up on the fence post waiting to see if something happens down below. <laughs> then the actual attack strategies are, are birds that hover and drop like the kestrel or harrier, um, stooping like the falcons. Um, gliding attacks, hawks, owls, tail chasing would be our cooper's hawks, um, and then stalking. Lots of our larger raptors will use a stalking technique, particularly owls, where um, they'll just fly from tree to tree and kind of keep following that prey until they get the opportunity to attack. <clears throat> so here are some different species um, of how these birds like to hunt. So what does a bird of prey do all day? Um, they actually do a lot, and they're very lazy birds in, as far as the bird family. If you think about a bird like a, a finch has to feed um, all day long, a hummingbird has to eat its weight in food daily just to survive. Um, birds of prey are going to rest and rest and rest some more as long as they have uh, the calories they need for that period of time before they have to hunt again. But while they're resting, they do preening, bathing, um, they may play. I think the most interesting play behavior in the raptor world is um, the northern harriers in the fall after the harvest in the cornfields will fly down into the fields, they'll grasp uh, corn cobs that are broken off to about the size of what would be a meadow vole, so just a couple inches long, three inches long, um, and they'll pick these corn cobs up, and it's usually juvenile raptors that I've noticed doing this, and I think there's been some papers done on this behavior, and they'll pick them up in their talons and fly off with them. Sometimes they'll drop them back down on the field and uh, jump back down on top of them, so it's, it's maybe some hunting practice, um, but it seems to just be play for the sheer fun of playing. But they choose corn cobs that are the size of their preferred meadow vole prey, so it's kind of interesting. <laughs> so here's some images of baths and feeding. The um, second picture on the left there is a, a bird feeding that's actually doing something called mantling, and also on the top left. And that's where they're actually covering their prey while they're eating it, because they don't want anybody to come down and steal it from them. <laughs> Um, these are some images of Pale Male, which is famous red tail in New York City, and his mate. Um, and in the upper right is a, a falconer's bird sitting on the ground with his dog. Um, and these birds actually come to like their dogs because they don't have to work as hard to hunt. Um, they're lazy in the air, just like they are lazy on the ground or on a perch, and the dog will flush the prey for them, and then the bird can go down and make the kill. So um, hunting hawks that are flown over dogs, just wait for the dog to do all the work and flush, and then they get the prey. <laughs> um, this is the hawk taking some nesting materials uh, in their beak back to their nest. 
Um, here, one of the red tails bringing some food back to his mate, part of the courtship behavior, and then the actual mating behaviors. So these are just things birds do every day in their normal raptor life. <laughs> there are also regional adaptations, uh, particularly size and color. For example, for example, great horned owls out west typically are smaller than our eastern cousins, and they're usually a lighter color. Um, Cooper's hawk's tails are longer perhaps to allow for more um, maneuverability. And um, kestrels in Mexico have learned to follow trains because the trains uh, flush up prey. Um, so they'll, you'll see kestrels flying alongside trains, getting the in, uh, insects and mammals that are stirred up and possibly even some birds stirred up by the machine going by. Most of our raptors are not particularly social, but 12 species will flock up on a regular basis. And we do have communal roosting, uh, plus the cooperative hunting and the Harris hawks. But the only real um, groupings of birds would be during migration. And uh, our broadwing hawks, for example, will form those huge kettles with thousands and thousands and thousands of birds. Um, we also have different migrating patterns. Some birds stay they hear, some move a little bit, some are complete migrators like our broad wings and osprey, and then some species like the snowy owl are, are eruptive where they just come down south of their arctic environment, particularly if the food prey base has changed. This can be really detrimental to snowy owls where a, a lot of them never make it back to the arctic uh, if they don't find the food supply they need when they come down into the, the states. Um, how did these birds migrate, they use a lot of different clues and techniques, um, landmarks, wind, uh, the star map, um, the magnetic field. Um, we know some species have some magnetite in their skulls, but there's probably some other areas that maybe contain magnetite in some cells where they can uh, orient to that field. And then um, the UV light. Um, even sound waves from the uh, wind and ocean. Um, the peregrine is the only raptor that's been proven to fly at night, but osprey probably do. And then our complete uh, migrants are the rough-legged hawk, osprey, and broadwing. They fly at different speeds. Here's a few of their average flight speeds while they're migrating. So of course our peregrines, probably one of the fastest, just moves right along. I guess if you're going to fly all night, you want to get on with it. <laughs> There's a lot of interesting myths about raptors. Um, the Greeks believed bad weather was controlled by osprey. Uh, one of my favorites is um, in the south, kids were told if they were bad, vultures would pick their eyes out. <laughs> so there's probably still some parents and grandparents in the south telling their children this. <laughs> Uh, raptors appear in about 21 Bible passages. Usually they represent freedom and wildness. Um, and then there are some a couple places in the world where um, people feed um, their dead to vultures. However, this has been actually outlawed in a few places because of the spread of disease. Uh, falconry is the sport of hunting with hawks, and it's a about 4,000-year-old sport. Most of the basic tenets are, are still practiced today, so the training and, and the culture that goes with the hunting of birds. And owls are still hunted in Europe. Um, a few people maybe in the States will have owls, but it's not a tradition here in the U.S. And the training includes traditional um, lure training and modern operant conditioning, um, positive reinforcement training, and enrichment for the birds. So this is a Mongolian burkut. Um, they raise golden eagles to hunt primarily wolves um, for their pelts. And <clears throat> the Birds get in tangles with wolves that sometimes can end up in injury for the bird. Um, but a lot of times what they'll do is if a bird is having trouble, and, and you imagine a bird with a seven-foot wingspan landing on top of a 100-pound canine, uh, it's, it's just incredible that a single eagle can take down a large animal like that. But if the bird gets into trouble, usually the bird coots will set, send out a second eagle to help assist. Um, they raise these eagles, they hand feed them, they keep them in their tents with them. So these, these birds are, are part of that cultural lifestyle too, and part of their families. 
Um, the Migratory Bird Act was um, in the Bald Eagle Protection Act of 1940 are probably our most commonly known protections for our raptors, but they are protected under Endangered Species and CITES treaties. Um, their, their primary conservation challenges is really loss of some of their migratory corridors and uh, pretty much all broadwing hawks, for example, fly through uh, Veracruz, uh, Mexico, which is now, you know, being developed by humans and a lot of the um, landscape there's got some trees and places for them to uh, roost at night and feed is, is being lost. Um, DDT is still being found in uh, raptor, particularly sharp shin hawk populations. Um, so they're still acquiring exposure in certain parts of the world. Um, <clears throat> hawk Mountain has the Hawks Aloft program. It tries to map all of the routes that these raptors are using and uh, reach the local conservation groups um, to try to protect them. Um, for those that might be interested in our most endangered raptors and our most recent extinctions, the Philippine eagle is down to um, really just probably less than 250 adults at this time. <laughs> California condor is hanging around 100 animals, um, still with the reintroductions to the wild. The snail kite, dependent on the green snail, um, as long as that food prey base continues to decline. Uh, this, snail is, this snail kite is so specialized, it's a challenge for them to find enough of the other their foods or adapt quick enough to different diets. The Flores hawk eagle in Indonesia is estimated to be less than 300 birds. And the Madagascan fish eagle, um, less than 400 individuals. <clears throat> Slender billed vulture uh, in India is uh, less than a couple thousand birds left. And they feed on uh, cattle that have been medicated. The last extinction uh, that we know about in recent time was about three, in the last 300 years was in 1900, was the Guadalupe Caracara. Anybody would like more information uh, about our raptor families or uh, what to do if you find an injured or sick raptor um, or need more information about uh, wildlife um, rescue and rehabilitation in general, you can contact me anytime at uh, either the phone number listed or my email address, which is bray at ohiowildlifecenter.org. Okay, it looks like we have a few minutes for questions. And our first question we have uh, coming in is, what is carrion? Carrion refers to um, dead animals. And so the meat um, that's available to uh, vultures and, and even red-tailed hawks and, and bald eagles are carrion eaters as well. So a, a raccoon or a possum or a rabbit gets hit on the road and it's on the road or the side of the road. Um, these raptors are going to see that carcass, or in the case of a vulture, may detect it through smell, they're going to land on the ground and, and start feeding on that meat. So, um, Bald eagles in Ohio prey on a lot of carrion in the winter, so if they find a deer carcass, they may feed off of that for, for several weeks. And I always feel sorry for juvenile bald eagles because they're learning how to catch fish and they go to all the trouble to uh, get their fish, and then some adult bald eagle will come over and steal it from them <laughs> because they're really kind of lazy and they don't have to catch the fish themselves if they can already eat the dead animal. So our next question is, um, will juvenile um, bald eagles stay together or um, separate as they get older? Um, juvenile bald eagles will disperse and they'll actually try to stay in their home territory that they're raised in, but once the uh, adult pair starts to court and get ready for um, the next season's breeding, which, which starts, that courting behavior starts around um, December, um, they're going to make sure those young are, are long gone, so they'll kick them out of the territory. Um, now you'll we'll see, bird, bald eagles are communal birds, so you'll see sometimes 
uh, multiple eagles. And, and of course, in the North Pacific Northwest, you may see 20 or 30 or 60 bald eagles all hanging around together. Um, in Ohio, we might see some communal uh, areas up around the lake. But if you're just looking out your back window and happen to see a bald eagle, it's probably going to be by itself. Um, looks like, um, what is the average territory size um, for a uh, red-tailed hawk? Red yeah. yeah, most red tails are going to maintain about a 10 square mile um, area, but there usually is going to be more than one red tail nest in that area. So they have a small area they're going to defend vigorously uh, a couple miles. They're going to have maybe a four or five mile area that they're going to kind of um, chase anybody out that tries to establish. Uh, but their, their main hunting area during their breeding season is, is on average going to be that 10 mile square area. And of course, they'll fly outside that area frequently to find food as needed. Bald eagles, for example, often will fly 30 to 50 miles outside their range for, for hunting during their um, time that they're feeding their brood. So um, they'll go quite a bit further if they have to. All right. Well, uh, any other quick questions? Otherwise, we're coming up on the end of our time here. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And um, do check our website, obcinet.org, for a recording of this presentation. And um, I again invite you to check that website for um, additional webinars coming up in our series. So thank you, Barbara. And uh, thank you all thank for joining you. us.